Thank you. I'm really surprised that you are so many here. I was not in the official program. I have nothing prepared. I don't have a slide. Whenever you want to ask something or if you want to start by asking something, I'm happy to try and answer. Otherwise, I'll just keep on bubbling about mostly about marketing communications and advertising. So if somebody is not interested in the subject, you're free to leave now. <laughs> so. <laughs> but but uh, I will start by telling that I was, I never thought I'd be in advertising. I always thought I'd be in architecture and I actually studied architecture in, in the technical high school of Vienna, Austria, and I worked in architectural offices in, in Finland uh, with some great and famous architects in Finland, and I realized that it's actually not my job. And, and it, like, one of the reasons was, well, one of the reasons was that Vienna those days was not very foreign friendly, so I never felt at home. But the other one was that in architecture, like I still love architecture, it's a dear hobby, but uh, the projects are really long. Like you start something, you have a vision and you have an idea that how this is gonna look. And then you work for a year and then somebody else takes over and three years later, you see the end result and there's nothing left of what you started. And it's also very restricted for the energy reasons and material reasons and cost reasons and so on and so on. So I decided to quit and I went first into graphic design and then I went into advertising. I started in advertising uh, 30 some years ago, I started as an art director's assistant. <laughs> By the way, this was like, this was before computers. There were no Macs. Actually, we had a, an electronic typewriter. We didn't, the only copy machine we had was where you take the positive and the negative and you feed them in and you take them out and you have one copy. And uh, one, I remember one day a guy from a reproduction company came to me and said that, that you know, some agencies have uh, acquired these telefaxes, so maybe you should consider getting one as well. Like, actually, this summer I was on holiday and I got a lot of phone calls, so I thought that I would make an auto reply if somebody calls me I could just push and it would send back a message saying sorry I'm busy please send me a fax. <laughs> like, I don't think too many people or too many offices have faxes anymore. And then uh, later on when I, I gained some fame in, fame in advertising a lot of the journalists asked me that are you sorry that you didn't become a famous architect I said I, that I don't think I would have become a famous architect, like most famous architects are re really old and they have the patience of an elephant. But then again, I think it's better for the mankind that if I make a mistake, it's over in 30 seconds instead of five generations have to suffer <laughs> of my mistakes. Too permanent. Yes, <laughs> way too permanent. But, uh, and I, and, as I said, I've been in, in the advertising business for over 30 years, and I would probably have quit already, maybe 10 years ago, retired or something, if the advertising business, marketing communications business, wouldn't be chasing all the time so fast. Like if it would still be the 30 second spot and the two spreads in a magazine, I would find that sort of boring. It's like, I don't know how many of you uh, are art lovers. I'm an art lover, but every now and then I go to an exhibition and I again see one meter by one meter oil painting and I start thinking, there must be something else. Like this has been going on for hundreds of years. 
somebody has to invent something. And of course, everybody is always inventing something in art. And some of those things become permanent and some of those things disappear. But, but marketing communications and digital world are merging fast. That's why I love the idea of this school, like, like getting, I, by the way, I don't limit creativity to marketing communications or art or creative professions, what are called so, the so-called creative professions. I think all people are creative. That's why we have survived as a species and, and uh, in our own minds become the kings of the world. Other animals might think differently, but that's what we think. And, and, uh, and like people say, what do you mean? And I, I said it yesterday at the round table. I said that if I look at the modern business history of the past 10 years, the accountants at Enron were far more creative than than anybody in the advertising business. Like out of just Excel sheets and numbers, nothing else, they created billions and billions and billions. Okay, uh, so, and, and I think that, that I and my colleagues and anybody who gets to exercise creativity in his daily work is extremely happy. Like Julia was speaking about uh, most people doing, doing something that they don't really like and they would stop if they could. I don't see that happening in my business. Like I think that people in, in advertising agencies and marketing communications agencies, they would do it even if I wouldn't pay them a salary. They, they just love it. And uh, of course, it makes it a lot easier to inspire them. All you have to do is show them something that somebody in another country has done, something spectacular, and they, <laughs> they will be happy for a week. Or you have to send them to Cannes for a week, and they see a lot of work that better people than them have done and they will be inspired for a year. So uh, now, uh, where was I? I was in, in technology and, and, and creativity. Uh, well, if you, look at, uh, if you look at what's happening in the world of marketing communications, like actually the Saatchi brothers uh, invented something, they were and still are extremely creative, they, they invented something that has shaped the world of marketing communications totally. They understood that you can combine the creative business of advertising and the creative business of financing and they went and did a reverse, they had a small agency and they were cooperating with Compton Worldwide uh, this was in the 70s, I think, and, and uh, everybody expected uh, Compton to buy such and such, but they, they went to some finance people and raised the money and did a reverse takeover and created worldwide such and such, and that changed the whole advertising business permanently and, and made it a, a holding company business which is still, which it, it, it still is, there are six worldwide holding companies that uh, basically like they, they go, their business is just to go around and buy advertising agencies from entrepreneurs like me. I've sold two agencies and it has been a good business for them because the stock exchange always rewards them by, by multiplying the revenue they buy about 25 times and they together, like the, the six holding companies together have secretly agreed that they will never buy, buy anything for a multiple more than seven and it's been working nicely. Now, that all started changing a couple of years back, which again has everything to do with this school and, and everything I've heard here today and everything I've said today. and. 
And all of a sudden, the consultancies, IBM, McKinsey, Deloitte, Accenture, and so on, and so on, and so on, started slowly buying creative advertising agencies, meaning companies that had nothing to do with the businesses they, were, they had and what they were doing daily. And, and I, of course, was really interested that in what's happening. And, and then I started realizing that because, of course, the consultants are not stupid. They are very analytical and, and very smart people. So they had already realized that there is a change going on on the client side. Like most clients, 99% of, of companies in the world still are organized as silos. They have a silo for marketing communication. They have a silo for service, they have a silo for distribution, they have a silo for uh, sales, they have a silo for product development, and so on and so on. And these companies had understood what the digital revolution that we also have heard about today. I even got a very boring looking but probably interesting book about it. And, and if you look at the, at the modern company, like I, I take as an example, I take Airbnb for the simple reason that I know it pretty well because we, one and a half years back, I lent one of my partners, uh, the founder of an agency that belongs to my group, I lent him to Airbnb in San Francisco for two years to be the creative director and, and uh, build their sort of internal marketing communications department. So that company, and it is just an example of the new uh, consumer-oriented companies, it doesn't have these silos. They have already merged them as one function which is called consumer consumer experience or customer experience. And they try to put the same creative storytelling in every touch point. Like you, you go on their website, you get the same story, you uh, rent one of the apartments that they rent, you get the same story. So it's all, all the same. And then like some of the most uh, intelligent old companies have already realized this, this and they have started merging their functions or silos and they are overlapping which of course creates tremendous friction because like if you have five functions you have five bosses and all of a sudden they have to start overlapping and only one of them can be the big boss so like I, I even have a a client who is the biggest bank in Finland and, and they have a fantastic CEO and uh, he, he has even publicly said that they have to go into different fields of business because banking business as we know it will disappear in less than 10 years. Like it's going to be totally disrupted and he has started uh, within the bank or the company he has started like who knows, do you have drive now in, in Rome, like the BMW you own where you only subscribe to a car and you look on your mobile and there's 10 cars within 200 meters and you can just go there and open it with your mobile and drive away. He started that in Finland and he started a lot of companies and he tells me about the troubles he has when they have a strategy session and he has the head of insurance and head of loans and head of whatever, like all the old bank functions and, and they agree on everything. And then he says, oh, this looks fine. Now who's going to run it? And all the guys say, well, I thought I should, I should be running it. So of course, it's going to be painful for many people and it's going to create destroy some jobs and create some some jobs but then like how many of you work in an advertising agency or have worked in an advertising agency well a few okay uh, 
last May, I went to, to uh, visit my partner at Airbnb, and they have a nice house in San Francisco, and, and I was there, like, uh, I waited for him in the lobby, which is a nice cafeteria area, of course, because it's a startup culture. Uh, I, I waited for him for 10 minutes, and when he finally arrives, I told him, Tony, you better call security immediately. And he says, why, what happened? I said, I saw an adult person walking here. Can't, can't be working at Airbnb. <laughs> Everybody was under 30 years old. And, and Tony had already, he had been there a year then, and he had already built the, the marketing communications department. He had hired uh, 36 people, and the average age was 28. So it's amazing. And, and also, like, it's built like no other company I've seen. Like, for example, when you're hired, uh, you don't have salary negotiations because they have a few organizational levels and everybody on the same organizational level has the same salary. So he said that he had, he had hired some people who, like, as we all have read, San Francisco has become terribly expensive. Like, you can't really afford an apartment. So people come from South, South America, uh, from rather poor countries, but they are good in coding or good in graphic design or something. They come, they go someplace and hire just a bed, and then they spend basically 24 hours at Airbnb because they have uh, four restaurants that are open 24 hours a day. They have uh, 20 different craft beers on tap, and you can just walk there and have a beer. So these young guys, they come over, they don't spend the money on anything. They eat and drink and spend their lives at Airbnb, and then they go off for a weekend someplace. So it's totally different. But then, like, uh, Tony showed me some of the stuff they do, and and... I've worked in advertising agencies for, 20, uh, for 30 years. Uh, Hassan and Partners is 26 years old. I, the, Hassan and Partners, the, the main agency in Helsinki, has about 100 people. And, and Tony shows me that, okay, any given moment, Airbnb might have 60 digital campaigns out. Now, every morning when he comes to work, he, his data analysts have, last night they have analyzed all the 60 campaigns, they have grouped them in, usually in three groups. These 20 campaigns uh, are working well, so put some more money behind them. These 20 campaigns, they have potential, but they are not working that well, and, and uh, you have to tweak them today, like, tweak every campaign and put it back and we'll tell you tomorrow if they're working any better. These 20 campaigns kill immediately and create new ones today. And I start thinking, okay, I have this advertising agency in Finland and, and uh, if a data analyst or usually a client would come and say, well, like, we need these 20 campaigns, my people would take out their calendars and say, would say, okay, you come back in uh, three weeks and we will debrief you in this. <laughs> and, and the modern companies are creating 20 new campaigns every day, day after day after day. So, of course, to change an advertising agency to work that way, well, you can do it, but you have to change 50% of the people and you have to... Uh, and it's going to, like, depending on, on the local laws, it's going to take years and you will have to pay severances and so on and so on. So it's basically, basically impossible. So uh, this is actually a secret, but uh, next week I'm opening an agency in San Francisco, which is working on this model, the new model. 
of being able to create new work every day. The problem, of course, in San Francisco is, sorry, I'll, I'll just tell this sentence first. Uh, like Tony told me that, that he had to go and hire a, a, the whole graduating class of Stanford data analysts and sciences, which he did, the whole graduating ca class, which resulted in them getting a letter from the Trump administration, uh, please come and explain why you're hiring just foreigners. Like, of course, it's not his fault that Stanford is full of Chinese and, and whatever, but no Americans. So, no, just a question. So, uh, which kind of data they um, Airbnb or can provide to these creative people to create this new campaign? And uh, if they provide any data, which are most useful? You're asking me a question I can't really answer because I, I don't work at Air, Airbnb and Tony doesn't tell me everything. He should, of course, but he doesn't. <laughs> or, and even if he did, I would not tell you. <laughs> no, but, but like, like they mostly concentrate on, on, like, they might be on Facebook or Google or different sites who does get click-throughs, how long do people stay on the site, how many book, and so on and so on. And of course, even that data gives the creative some direction that, okay, these kind of things seem to be working better than these kind of things, and then these are not working at all, so let's create something different. But it's live and learn experience. Of course, they as you live and learn, you accumulate some knowledge and understanding and so on and so on. And well, when I, I, I don't know how many agencies in Italy have data scientists, but when I got back, I said to my managing director that next hire you do is better be a data analyst so that we start learning at least. Like if you don't pay any attention, you will never learn. And again, I don't know about Italy, but, but uh, the media agencies in the Nordics have a lot of the data. They are already learning, but they have no incentive of giving it to the advertising agency, especially not next day. Like they want to create their own stuff. So I'm also considering starting a digital media agency because it used to be so that, that the client had an advertising budget. That advertising budget, like a media agency, an advertising agency, a direct marketing agency, and a PR agency tapped into that and lived out of that money. Now I can easily list 20 different agencies that tap to the same budget. There's marketing automation, there's social media agencies, there's data analysts, and so on, and so on, and so on. So that, of course, leaves the advertising agency less money, so, and, and also less power. So I have to, and that's why Accenture and these are, of course, buying the agencies, because they already have the other capabilities. So they want to implement the storytelling and, and raise on the value chain. So my daily job is not to create ads or even talk to the clients, but try and find the people who will help me to get these other disciplines and integrate them to, to our existing uh, operations so that I would get higher on the value chain. Because if not, one day my client has merged already all his functions, his silos, he has one function and the name is customer experience. And he looks and says, why are we going to 20 different vendors to buy this stuff when we could get it all from Accenture? And of course, there's somebody who says, well, Accenture's creativity is not as good as Hassan and Partners. But the guy says, well, we can do with 90% of the creativity if we don't have to run to 20 different pages. The vendors every day. So uh, it's, it's very, very different than what it was 
sorry I bored you, but. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, th that is basically the story in short. I will continue, but it would be nice if somebody would ask something or comment on something because I see a lot of nodding people. So obviously many people know what I'm talking about. Yes. When do you see the future of um, digital advertising? Now we see outstream with advertising, we see, uh, we've facilitated some uh, chatbot conversational advertising yeah. inside of Banner or MSG, is a that company sharing it. And um, just your opinion on what well, we see. Because we see that attention yeah. for the advertising probably is the next goal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. uh, because until now we just uh, see the you know, same video, it's a hope that uh, you have your activity or stuff like that. Yeah. But really, people are really interacting with that advertising, are really enjoying your, your apps. Yeah. And so we are trying to understand how to, uh, to shape our solution that we basically provide in chatbot right. for the advertising market. Okay. I start from 10 to 15 years back uh, when the first digital agencies were started and when the first digital evangelists in, in marketing communications business started appearing and, and they went in front of intelligent audiences like this and they said the following. They said, first of all, uh, all all advertising will in a few years become digital because you can measure digital. Okay, now already then I remember thinking that, but you can measure anything. Like uh, I once read an article that said that the French kiss 14 seconds longer than the British. And if you can measure that, you can probably measure everything in a print ad or a TV ad. So measuring is not a new thing. Okay, then you look what has happened. Yes, you can measure everything and you can fraud every number. Like uh, you've read about the, the uh, f fraud clicks on, on uh, digital advertising and the fake numbers from Facebook and Google and everything which is, of course, very stupid, very disgusting, very downgrading to all of our business. Like if we, cons if we are constantly, like one part of our value chain is constantly, constantly caught lying, who is going to believe our next advice? So we have to clean that act. And, and now, thank heavens, we have a, a good, motivation because that's the reason WPP's stock price went down and uh, knowing Martin Sorrell he will not take it easily and Mark Pritchard is also speaking about it and everybody listens when he speaks because he's the best b biggest advertiser the chief marketing officer of Procter & Gamble okay but it's measurable that part didn't happen in 15 years. The second thing they told that advertising on TV and newspapers and magazines and so on is interruptive and that's why it is bad. In the future the consumer can choose if he looks or doesn't look at the advertising. It needs to be engaging, it needs to be better. Consumers have to like it. Now, which one of you is of the opinion that in the fa past 15 years, advertising has gotten more entertaining and more engaging than it used to be? You are? Okay. Very good. I think most advertising has gotten worse. Most banners are not even clicked at. Uh, even offline advertising has gotten worse. But please tell me. I think this is the, the real new thing in the advertising world because it's 
Yeah, yeah. Well, pe people ask me that, for example, that, that when will the young people realize that the uh, YouTube stars are, are giving them commercial information or selling stuff? And I look at them and I say, I think they understand it already, but they don't care. <laughs> like, they think it's entertaining. Then they can decide if they want to buy or not. I agree, like that's a lot of the native advertising is entertaining and fun and people go there. But for some reason we have decided even in front of YouTube videos to put 15 seconds of something that nobody wants to look at. I think that this is dying. <laughs> I think that YouTube stuff measured that this doesn't work. Yeah, but... Uh, I heard this, uh, I heard this new. Yes. But, but they, they have invented something new, which is six-second advertising. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, it's all about the money, so, so it depends on how you measure. They used to, they started by measuring, if you look at it for three seconds, it's a view and they can charge you. No, I... Yeah, that, that's exactly the point that I wanted to make, because uh, in my experience, the, 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 the big mistake is that we keep trying to measure the click. Yeah. To measure. Yeah. And, and, and so very often, yeah. I'm, as a consumer, it's like Jan said in his session this morning, as a consumer, I'm exposed to a lot of advertising that makes an impact, creates the brand awareness, and things yeah. like that. But I don't click on it. And I yeah. don't need to click on it for it to be efficient yeah. and to be effective. Yeah. And it's the I never, never clicked on a newspaper ad. Yeah, and, and, but you, you see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you go back to the print advertising that you can measure. You can yeah. measure awareness, you can measure, measure recall. There are all yeah. things that you can measure. Yeah. But I agree with the point that uh, uh, there is a, a, an over uh, discussion about the clicks and the, the metrics and the graphs. They're nice, but if the I, I, I see a video that I'm going to discuss that my friends share with me that has absolutely no production value, but it has message value. Mm. The message is more important than the production sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And advertising is not a science. It's a, like Bill Bernbach said that that it's it's a, it's also called persuasion, and persuasion is an art. Like there is no way I can persu persuade one of you to do something that you don't want to unless I'm extremely skillful. <laughs> Which I am, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> now, like, uh, okay, to another story, which is my, both my parents uh, were doctors and, and uh, so early on I understood that actually as some of you know, uh, the, the science of medicine is not a real science either. Like there's still a lot of stuff that nobody has proved really works. But once you put on a white coat and a stethoscope, everybody believes you. I, when I was a young kid, I used to go to my, my mother's practice. My mother was an ear, ear nose, and throat doctor and, and help her and get paid for it. It was a summer job. And when I was there, and especially if an old lady walked in, they would always come to me and say, well, doctor, like they couldn't understand that my mother could be a doctor. She's a lady, like how can a, how can a woman be a doctor? And, and uh, advertising is the same, like we, we will never because it's creative, as medicine is creative. If you look at house, it's an excellent example of creative medicine. So, so you just get the feeling that, okay, this is going to work. And of course, you can A-B test, but you can't create an Excel or a flow chart that will prove that beforehand that this will work. Now, uh, my agencies very recently went through a, a training which looks extremely promising 
we, we hired a consultancy from uh, US called Agency Agile that totally transforms the way we work. We work like all advertising agencies used to work. We get the brief, we come back with the debrief and so on and so on and so on. And, and we got actually a client convinced us that, that they only get the business benefits at the end, but the risk of them getting or not getting them raises the further we go. And I looked at a lot of, like, as everybody probably has done, has done like looked at Scrum and everything, and, and, and I never felt really comfortable of bringing that to the advertising agency environment, but then I found this company in US in Los Angeles called Agency Agile, and they said that they actually changed the way you work and they do the opposite. You spend more time with the client in the beginning and, and you and the client create the brief together. You ask a million questions and you look at the million things and you scope it in the beginning. So the risk of doing something that doesn't work and the client doesn't approve gets smaller the further you work and the client starts getting business benefits already halfway to, through the process. And they showed me, amazingly enough, like they showed me that, that uh, their clients, the agencies they have worked with, and they've worked with a lot of agencies, have gained uh, profit increases of 10 to 25 percent. Uh, client satisfaction is up, employee satisfaction is up. So. Google it, Agency Agile, a very good company. Okay, but back to my parents, the doctors. Like, like any good boy, my, they were both respected doctors and, and my father was a university professor and a scientist and a teacher. And of course, at some point, like when I had gone from architecture to advertising, I, I had an identity crisis. Like my, both my parents are doing an important job. They are saving lives and teaching people and, and finding cures for diseases. What am I doing? I'm at the worst. I worked with McDonald's for 11 years. So at the worst, I'm, I'm pushing hamburgers to teenagers. And, and uh, 10, 10, okay. And uh, I'll tell this and then you can ask. Okay. Uh, and then I, like, I went through the identity crisis and, and I said that, that to myself that, okay, I still like this job. It, it pays well. I'm, I'm happy. The, my clients are happy. So I came to the conclusion that the only way I can live with this if is that I have to try and do the utmost best I can in this business that I've selected. And then I thought that what is, what is the, the utmost best that I can do? And, and of course, we all have hero agencies all around the world and, and uh, hero creatives and so on and so on. So I said to myself that, okay, let's finish advertising has never been sort of very big internationally, but if, if we could make one of the best agencies in Europe, that would already be something. And, and I spoke to my partners and we decided, okay, that's what we'll do. And we even created KPIs, like uh, how many awards we have to win internationally and how much profit margin we have to make. And amazingly enough, three years later, we had won more international awards than, than all Finnish advertising agencies in the 50 years of Finnish advertising history combined. Our profit margin was over 30% and so on and so on. So, uh, that helped me uh, survive in the advertising business. I know that all of us advertising people are rather cynical, but uh, 
once you set some goals to yourself and one, once you follow them, then you can your, you don't have to care about what other people think. You can decide yourself if you have succeeded or not. We have about eight minutes. Does anybody have a, have a question? Advertising can be too much. It can become overwhelming. Like in social media, Facebook, everything is advertised right now. Sometimes it's, I, I use a lot of, you know, go, go story, you know, key trackers and stuff like that. So a lot of the times I don't really get ads and stuff, but when they happen to, you know, browse Facebook on a computer, which is not mine, and you know, I look for a pair of shoes, and then I go to Facebook and it looks like the internet was designed to sell me that pair of shoes. I mean, it can become scary. Is that something that you take into account when you? Of course, like I totally agree that there's too much advertising. Like there, there is nothing that can't be sold as advertising space. And I speak a lot with, uh, with startups, so I ask them, what is your revenue model? And they usually answer advertising, and I say, well, so you want to go compete with Google and Facebook. And, and of course, there's too much advertising, too much bad advertising. And to your example, like you look at the pair of shoes, there's a, another wonderful thing to Google, which is marketoonist. A, a an advertising guy in the U.S. who does comics on on uh, sort of real life situations, and one especially complies to what you're saying. There's a family gathered in a living room. The the mother is opening his her birthday present and taking up a sweater and saying, "Oh, this would be such a wonderful surprise." if not all our banners in all our devices would have been telling me for a month already that somebody has looked at this. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but of course, it's early days. So uh, I believe, and I hope, but I, I also believe that in the end, uh, once it gets more sophisticated and the algorithms get better and so on and so on, us consumers will find true value in, in the fact that the advertising we see will be relevant. But it's going to take some time. Were you asking something? No? No? Okay. Anything else? No? How many minutes do I have? Five. I'll ask a question. Okay. <laughs> you, you mentioned the analogy with medicine. Yes. And once I heard that medicine, the big change in medicine is that it's moving from eminent states to evidence states. Mm. Uh, in a way, similar in communication. But, yeah. Uh, when have we gone too far? When is the evidence? too much uh, is, is that a point I, I, I'll just put some context into this um, I was watching that movie Minority Report recently yes. again yeah. and that in that movie they or in the book Philip yeah. Dick talked about the reality in 2034 that's 17 years from now and we're already seeing most of the things that uh, yeah was the future is already there. Except the screen where you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, what is the risk that we go too far with, with this evidence, with the data, with the learning and the machine learning and the algorithms and the, the why? When is, there, is it going to be the time that we scale down? Or are we? I don't know. That? Like, like uh, when you read the predictions, the creative professions, like, creating an ad uh, will be the, the last to disappear, if they ever disappear. Uh, th and there's a simple reason for that. And, and uh, most people who have worked in the advertising business have heard sort of this, this analog. Like, if I stand here and tell you I'm a funny guy, you will not believe me. If I tell you a joke and you laugh, you will think, I'm a funny guy. 
if I tell the same joke five times, you will no longer think that I'm a funny guy. So in medicine, of course, you have the same symptoms, you do the same operation or give the same medicine or whatever. In advertising, the, the nature of advertising is that you have to renew yourself every time. You have to tell a different story or a different joke or something to be something else than boring. So I don't know how much... But there is also this evergreen effect. In, in the oh, language oh. business, I, I say that why is it that every year I have to explain to people why you have to do Spanish for Latin America and Spanish for Europe? Don't people know? I've been saying this for 35 years. Yeah. It's like five times the same joke. Yeah. But every year there's a new generation that comes into the market and they don't know about that. So yeah. there is an element of repetition, I believe. In a way, but, but like basically, what does advertising do? Of course, we can say that it sells. But, but for me, advertising exists to make brands and products culturally relevant. And the culture develops and changes all the time. Like if you want to advertise Converse shoes and you take the same ad you showed to the previous generation, it will not ring a bell because the culture has changed. So, but like, I don't know if I, if I knew I would probably be somewhere coding the next great ad <laughs> instead of trying to think it up. So, Thank you. okay. Thank you. Thank you.